I just want to acknowledge that our work at EBC Vancouver takes place on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam uh, people. I'm fortunate to have been born and currently settle, live and play and currently work where I am right now on the territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish peoples. As we begin to think about online learning experiences, uh, I think it's uh, really great to consider all of the, the, the different lands and their stories from where you and your learners study, live, work and play and having a space where that might be shared. If you'd like to share your own uh, land uh, where you where you currently reside and work, please do so um, in the chat. I'm just going to share the native land uh, link. Uh, and Marie will take us away with uh, the session objectives and overview. Um, so, hi everyone. So we're here to guide you through things that you're going to that need to be done um, for teaching an online course. Um, we're going to go over a lot of information, um, but don't worry about having to remember everything, because as part of this, we're introducing um, a newly developed course, and you're going to have access to that course. Um, so we've got one main objective today, and that's an awareness of what needs to be done before the course starts, during the course, and at the end of the course. So within each of those three areas, that includes creating or modifying Canvas content, identifying strategies to help students achieve academic success, and communicating with students throughout the term. Uh, yeah, so quickly our session overview, um, and it follows along with the, what the four modules are for the course. I'm gonna start with an introduction and overview, and then go into the course modules. So divided into what do you need to get ready before the start of the term, what needs to be done during the course and um, for concluding the course. So we even kept in mind um, that there are some instructors that are hired with, um, you know, maybe a week <laughs> before the course starts. So this is thinking that somebody has already got a course that's got some course materials and they're teaching a fully online course. So it's like, ah, so this is the resources to help people get started. Um, and I'll just say it's been developed in collaboration with, um, uh, well, several people from the learning design team in CTLT, also with people from the LT Hub, like Eric Lee. It's also been reviewed by a few other faculty ISS people. Um, so Mina Kalan from Arts ISIT, uh, Jenny Wong, who supports science. She is CTLT. Um, and uh, uh, Fayeza Mufti from Education. Um, and also we had a couple of distance ed instructors review the courses. Uh, Katie Lee Bunting from Occupational Therapy, <laughs> I had to remember that one, um, and Sarika Bose from English. Um, so it's been an amazing process to go through and get this feedback from the people who have been right there helping the new instructors get started on what they need to do. Um, so we'll just go on to the next piece then. Um, so just very briefly, um, we're going to pause for questions at the end of each module, which includes in a few seconds. <laughs> um, so, but if, feel free to ask questions in the chat while we're um, while we are speaking, um, and during the question time, you can ask, ask questions either by turning on your microphone or by putting them in the chat. And just as a reminder, the session will be recorded. Um, so just to begin with, get you thinking, do you have any burning questions right now? Okay, I'll ask you that question again <laughs> um, as we give you a little bit more information, give you time to think about that. Um, so in the introduction and overview module, um, this module just introduces what the course is about. Um, John, can you move to the next slide? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, thanks, John. Um, the goal is to help instructors who are new to teaching fully online courses quickly develop the skills and knowledge um, that they need to um, engage with their students and teach online. Uh, it's a self-paced course and it has reflection activities and interaction activities, also examples from instructors um, that they've 
um, used in their courses. Um, it'll take about eight to 10 hours to go through and there's support available along the way. So you can reach out to one of the educational consultants, um, which would be people from the learning design team and also from the LT Hub. And of course, faculty ISS support units, I know are always available to help. Um, the actual course is open and um, we'll give you the um, link to the Canvas course. Um, we'll post it in the chat a little bit later on, um, but you can access the course at any time as well. Um, so are there any burning questions? Asking that again <laughs> in the chat. No, I don't see anything in chat. Okay, I think that means we're good to go. Good to continue on then, Eric. Thanks so much, Marie. So yeah, um, I'll be go going over the first module, uh, what to do before the start of term. Um, John, would you mind? That's, yeah, perfect. Uh, so Canvas is uh, UBC's learning management system. Uh, this is the central platform where you can put course content, uh, assess your students, and just handle communications with your students as well. Um, at the start of term, you will need to bring some form of content into your Canvas course. And if you taught in Canvas before, Canvas does have a handy tool where you can copy your content from a previous course to the live current course. And this tool can be found if you go into the settings of the course, and then there's an import course content button there. Um, and we always advise you to start as early as possible. Uh, we create the Canvas courses uh, around two or three months before the term start. So for the winter courses that start in September, we actually had it available sometime in June. So we would always advise starting as early as possible to give you time to uh, play with your course content, see what you like, see what you don't like. And also just it, it reduces the crunch time that we often see um, happen the week before term start. Um, yeah, and there's a couple settings that you can play with while you're importing course content to make it a little bit easier. One that I always suggest using is use the events and due dates shift option. And on this option, if you check it under the tool, you'll be able to uh, shift all your dates, all the due dates from prior term to the new term, just by adding in the dates from the prior term as a start date and the new term as a start date. And if you're uh, if you like some more support with this process, you're welcome to contact your instructional support unit um, for help with this. You're also welcome to contact the LT Hub as well. I'll just introduce a lot of the tools that, that are available for you to use in Canvas. Um, I'll go over each one shortly, um, but you're also welcome to explore it a little further as well. So the modules is, I think, the primary organizational tool in Canvas. This is where you can organize your course content based on weeks, days, topics, or themes. You can think of a module kind of as a folder where you can then put other items in, such as pages, announce, uh, assignments, or discussions. But things are centered around modules typically. You don't have to use it, but it's very commonly used. Uh, pages, this is where you can include uh, text, images, videos onto a page. This is where bulk of course content lives. And to add content onto a page, Canvas provides something called a rich content editor. It looks a lot like Microsoft Word, uh, and you can add your course content in that way. Uh, announcements, this is a tool to broadcast messages to your students. An example announcement could be something regarding uh, changed assignment instructions, uh, information about a final exam, or maybe some new course info. Uh, assignments, assignments is where uh, you can have any gradable item. Um, any gradable item in Canvas course is referred to as an assignment. Uh, this tool is used for accepting submissions from students, whether it be through like a file upload or a text response. And once a student has submitted to an assignment, you can grade it use, using what Canvas calls uh, the speed grader. This is where you can view the student submission, grade the student submission, as well as provide feedback. And uh, another place for students to contribute a submission is through discussions. Uh, discussions is a space to hold um, discussion forum between you and your students. The discussions could be a place to discuss course content, of course materials, or as well as a place for students to pose questions. It's a uh, more, it's very open-ended, yeah. Quizzes is another form of a gradable item that you can use in Canvas. A quiz is, uh, as you might expect, it's a quiz, is Canvas's examination tool. In contrast to an assignment, uh, quizzes can have preset questions and um, has more quizzing settings and capabilities such as time limits and um, having different timelines for different students, um, stuff like that, yeah. 
Now, finally, groups. Groups um, can integrate with some of the above tools I just mentioned. I just mentioned, such as assignments and discussions. If you want to set up some group work, this is where you're going to uh, set those up. Uh, groups can also be set up as self sign up, or you can manually put them into place. Um, but this is helpful if you want to do like a group assignment or discussion where you're just splitting uh, students off into pairs or groups of three or however. Mm -hmm. now, the other side of tools I'll mention are uh, tools that are not exactly Canvas tools, but they may be integrated with Canvas. But well, we find that they're also very commonly used in courses. So the first I'll mention is Zoom. Zoom is typically used for lectures, delivering lectures online, or maybe some office hours. There is a Zoom integration with Canvas where you can have your courses Zoom meetings and recordings populated onto a single Canvas page. This is an integration that you'll need to enable in your course navigation if you want to use it. Kaltura, this is UBC's primary media sharing tools, kind of like YouTube at UBC. Uh, we always recommend uploading videos to Kaltura rather than Canvas because Canvas has a limited file storage. Kaltura is unlimited. Um, and there's also better playback in Kaltura as well. So how it works is you upload the Im uh, you upload the video to Kaltura and then you embed it onto a Canvas page. And that's how you can get a video onto a Canvas page. If you happen to upload a lot of videos into your Canvas course rather than Kaltura, you're going to run out of space and you won't be able to upload some simpler items such as like a PDF file or a document. Uh, so we, we always recommend using Kaltura over Canvas for videos. Uh, library online courses, or we shorten that to Locker, just say quicker. But this is um, the tool to uh, add readings to your course. So how it works is you will have to request uh, library materials from the library, and the library will clear the copyright for those um, materials. Once they have cleared the copyright, a student can click on the Locker link within your course to access those uh, library materials. Um, and this is another item that you'll need to enable in your navigation for students to be able to um, click into. So it's another setting to enable, yeah. A lockdown browser. Uh, this is an option to secure a Canvas quiz while it's being written. On a lockdown browser quiz, students are not able to visit any other page except the quiz itself. Uh, if you're a little concerned about academic integrity, this is a way to lock down your quiz. The well, final one I'll mention is Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is a team chat tool. Uh, it's not integrated with Canvas, but um, it provides a space for your students to all chat together, um, as well as you to communicate with your students through a team format. And there's more uh, integrated tools as well, but these are the ones we see primarily used in um, online courses. Yeah, so uh, I just included a quick little screenshot here to show you how modules work. I think modules is the primary tool that's used in Canvas. Uh, as you can see here, there's a module one. Um, some people say, some people put it as like week one or a theme one, but in this module, you could have like an overview page, a discussion, some assignments, quiz, as well as um, links. So this is just a quick way to, this is just a quick screenshot to show you how um, a course could look in Canvas. Yes. And now the next thing I'll go over are, is the settings of the course. This is by no means all the settings that we suggest using, but uh, these are the most common ones that I see adjusted. Um, so the first thing you'll need to think about is availability. Uh, when will your course be available for your students to access and do work in? So the default term dates that we provide is typically fine for most cases. And how the default term dates works is the first day of class is when the course will be available. The last day of class, uh, sorry, uh, the last day the course will be available is eight weeks after the last day of class. So you get that little time range. If you do want to open your course early, you will have to put in a custom course start date. And how you do that is going to the settings of your course and you change your participation setting from term, which is the default setting, to course. Once you do that change, you can enter in a custom course start date. Now, if you do enter a custom start date, make sure you ask, uh, also enter an end date because if you only have a start date and no end date, the course will be open forever. And we definitely want courses to end, yeah. And uh, publishing your course. What publish means is that uh, it'll be available for students to access once the course date starts. We always recommend publishing as early as possible, even a week or two in advance if you could. Um, if you publish it early, it doesn't really uh, release it to students early. It will make it automatically release at the course start date. But if you don't publish it, 
it won't be available automatically at the course start date. So you might as well just publish um, as early as possible. The next setting I want to go over is gradebook um, settings. This one is, um, I guess, a little bit uh, complicated to understand when you first look at what manual or automatic grade posting policy means. The title isn't very descriptive, but uh, and what an automatic grade posting policy means is grades will release the students as soon as you provide a grade to them. A manual grade posting policy means that you will have to manually release these grades to your students uh, when you choose. And instructors who choose the manual, they tend to release the grades after they've graded all students. And the default is automatic, so you'll have to change it to manual if you do want to have more control over when students see their grades. Uh, the last setting I'll mention is navigation setting. So this is where you can reorder your course navigation, where you can put assignments above discussion or announcements, or you can even remove some Canvas tools entirely or add the tools that I mentioned prior that are not on by default. Um, another thing you want to check over before the start of term is accessibility. Um, it's very important to incorporate accessibility checks because it removes any burden from students having to ask for help. Some students may choose not to request help, even if it compromises their ability to learn because of this burden. Some students may not know to ask for help and because not all students realize their accommodation needs uh, qualifies for assistance. It will save time for you to consider accessibility checks from the start rather than later. It's quick to do and you won't have to spend any time redoing any work later. And I'll do a quick mention of what um, each of these checks mean. If you add alt text to an image, this allows a screen reader to read an image. So you want to be a little descriptive of what the image is showing or saying, and that's how you can add more functionality for screen readers. Uh, closed captions for videos. This will make videos easier to follow um, without sound, for example. Uh, making your hyperlinks descriptive, this one is not as commonly understood, but you want to describe any links that you include in your course content. A link that just says click here without much context isn't very descriptive. Um, you want to be very descriptive when you link to something just so then um, people understand where they're clicking into. And you want to also ensure that uh, the font, the text that you use, appropriate size and contrast. I think black and white is typically very good and just using the standard font is fine. But if you do choose to make things a little fancier using your own design, just make sure there's appropriate contrast and size. Um, the last one is using headings where appropriate. Uh, so headings is a little uh, function that you can use to mark a piece of text as a heading. Some people choose to just make larger font rather than using the heading option. The heading option is better because it allows um, accessibility tools to jump within uh, the page and understand the hierarchy of the page better than if you just made fonts bigger. Now, Canvas provides also an accessibility checker um, at the bottom of their little rich content editor. And if you click on that, it'll give you a little um, message of whether they found any uh, accessibility issues. But uh, it, it's good to consider these on your own because I think the accessibility checker can't check for everything. Uh, it's just a pre programmed tool. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is um, just checking over your course and how you can do that. Canvas provides a student view where you can see how things operate from the student perspective. Now, this tool is available from the home page in the top right corner, I believe. And if you click on that, you'll enter into a different uh, screen where you are now accessing your course as a student. Uh, so you won't see the things that you will see as an instructor, such as settings and things like that. You'll be entering as if you, you can even do submissions as a student and see how that works on their end or do quizzes to see how they might see the quiz. There are some tools that are not compatible with Canvas Student Views, usually integrations, because that doesn't exactly mesh well with Canvas always. Uh, the biggest one I would say is Kaltura. Um, any Kaltura videos will not appear in Student View. If you do want to test things like Kaltura or Lockdown Browser or Locker, Library Online Course Reserve, I would suggest contacting your instructional support unit or us, the LT Hub, to help with testing these tools. We will have to provide what's called a true student view through a different student account. Yeah. Uh, the last little tip I'll mention is that Canvas provides a link validator, and this is available from the course settings. Uh, if you click on the link validator and you start the link validation, it's an automatic process to check for broken links. And Canvas will also tell you why the link is broken, whether it's um, 
going to a broken link within the course or it's a broken external link. But it's a good thing to check right before you start a course just to make sure there, there isn't any um, broken links that students will click into. And I think that's all I was going to talk about today. I don't see any uh, questions in the chat, but feel free to uh, unmute yourself and um, let me know your questions. All right, I'll take silence as there are no further questions, but feel free to keep those questions locked and loaded. Uh, you can bring them up at any time in the session. So I'll pass it over to uh, John next to discuss what to do during the course. Thanks, Eric. So um, I'll be discussing the next module during the course. And uh, teaching online requires different skills, strategies, and tools than teaching in a classroom, as you may know. Success in teaching online um, is related to how present and engaged the instructor is in, in the course. And during the course, there are several things to consider in your practice. Uh, creating a teaching presence, implementing effective synchronous and asynchronous online teaching practices, uh, how you grade assessments and provide feedback online, uh, possibly using rubrics to do that, and how we would encourage academic integrity. Uh, providing opportunities for interaction between students, instructors, and course materials is key to enabling a rich, meaningful, and engaging learning experience online. And a useful way to consider the interactions that promote student learning is uh, something called the Community of Inquiry Model, which is developed by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. This model identifies three dimensions of presence that define learning interactions. There's social, cognitive, and teaching. The model suggests that effective learning experiences occur when the three dimensions co coincide. And so social presence is about interaction with peers. Cognitive presence is the extent to which learners are able to construct meaning through reflection, interaction with content. And teaching presence is the design, facilitation, and direction of cognitive and social processes to achieve learning outcomes through interaction with instructors. The first week of the term can be a really critical, critical time to connect with students uh, in establishing a teaching presence in the course. So consider creating a text or video welcome message to introduce yourself, your background, you know, perhaps a course overview to the class. Welcome message can be triggered through a Canvas announcement, a page or a discussion post. Uh, you may also want to encourage students to introduce themselves through an introductory discussion thread and providing some flexibility how they do this. So maybe through text, or video, audio. Think also about how you might use Canvas's course access report to reach out to students who have not yet accessed the course and how you will need to engage with uh, teaching assistants to prepare for the delivery of, the, of your course. During the course, it's uh, also important to maintain your teaching presence by continuing to connect with your students. This could be done through consistent asynchronous engagement activities such as uh, using uh, regular course-wide announcements, emails, or discussion posts on key messages and learning activities, responding to student discussion posts, providing feedback on that, checking student participation through analytics, and engaging in off-topic discussion threads. You might also want to think about ways you can engage synchronously with your students, such as offering one-on-one -on -one flexible office hours through video conferencing, uh, such as through Zoom or Microsoft Teams, offering group office hours, and even sometimes a live synchronous session if that's uh, available for you. Another way to gauge your students during the course is by collecting mid-course feedback so that you can adapt and be responsive to any course improvements along the way. Uh, when assessing your students with formative or summative assessments, we encourage you to provide feedback. Formative assessments, uh, such as polls, self-assessments, discussion boards, quizzes, can help learners gauge how well they've learned and where they need to focus additional studies to prepare for, prepare for summative assessments. Uh, the purpose of a summative assessment, such as a midterm 
final exam, final papers, multimodal projects or presentations is to determine whether students have learned their expected learning outcomes. Feedback that you provide students can be both formal and informal. Formal feedback is usually planned and provided to all students in a consistent manner, whereas informal feedback tends to be more spontaneous and immediate. Feedback can also be formative or summative. Formative feedback provides students with opportunities to reflect and improve upon their learning, whereas summative feedback is provided with an overall assessment of their learning. And so when providing effective feedback, consider the content, timing of your feedback, as well as uh, providing synchronous and asynchronous options and what that might look like. So using emails or an assignment rubric, um, discussion posts, um, or your office hours, these are all options uh, that you might want to consider. If you have any students who have accessibility accommodations that are approved by the Center for Accessibility, uh, it's also a good time to review your Canvas quiz and assignment settings to accommodate students who require extra time, perhaps alternate due dates. Rubrics. So a rubric is an assessment tool that indicates achievement criteria across. It can be used with all types of assessment, including written, oral, and visual assessments. Rubrics can help students understand assessment expectations and how their work will be graded. Instructors might find that rubrics will, are beneficial in providing feedback on marking assignments, class, participant, class, class participation, or overall grades. And the use of a rubric can help uh, standardize instructor and TA marking. Um, and they can be helpful for students to conduct self and peer reviews. Canvas allows you to add a rubric to an assignment, a quiz, or a graded discussion. Uh, and doing so will allow you to comment and grade student work uh, with the rubric and attach to the speed grader. In Canvas, you have three options to grade assignments uh, or assessments in general. The gradebook, uh, which Eric mentioned earlier, uh, using speed grader to grade and write comments while viewing student work or grading offline exporting and exporting to a spreadsheet. Uh, Canvas style rubrics can also be embedded as part of an assignment or a quiz. So an effective rubric is uh, transparent where the assignment criteria is aligned with your outcomes and your assessments. They're integrated with assignments, especially if they are peer uh, if there are peer or self assessments. They're used in teaching so that students can make decisions about their current work and where and how they can improve based on the rubric criteria. Rubric and effective rubrics are practice. So if you teach a course where multiple teaching assist assistants share the responsibility of grading, have them practice grading uh, these assessments using your rubric. Academic integrity. So. When teaching your course, it's important to educate your, your students on academic responsibilities and building a culture of integrity in, in uh, the online classroom. So make sure your students are aware of UBC's academic integrity website and UBC's policies on academic integrity and misconduct. Consider including your rationale for academic integrity on the course syllabus, as well as links to perhaps the Learning Commons Ac Academic Integrity website. Also provide links to UBC guidelines for cit citation styles you might expect students to follow for assessments and things like that. Uh, make, at, uh, make integrity expectations clear to students on all assessments. So be very explicit and perhaps include um, sort of a personal message at the start of each assessment, like such as I expect all students will complete a, this quiz without consulting a XYZ. And finally, encourage students to contact you if they have challenges with deadlines or technology rather than to resorting to cheating. And so that's sort of the end of my section. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself 
or type it in the chat and I'd be happy to respond. Also, if you think of any questions along the way, we can respond to them at the end of uh, the session as well. I think we'll pass it on to Marie, who will discuss the conclusion of uh, an online course. Um, yeah, thanks, John. So as an instructor, um, there's, you know, you've gone through the course, you've been doing the grading, you've been connecting with your students. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, need to be done at the end of the course. Um, and so, John, if you can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, there are two pieces of communications to do with your students at the end of the course. So the first one is two weeks before the end of the course, um, invite students to complete uh, the course evaluation survey using the student experience of instruction tool. And so you'll get the link to this, you'll get information about this from your um, faculty on um, when the dates are available um, for that each term. Um, when you're doing this, you wanna tell your students why you're asking for this. Um, let your students know that you might be making changes to the course as the result of their feedback. Um, also let them know how the information might be being used at UBC. Um, so as I said, it could be used to improve the courses. Um, it could be used as part of a, a tenure or a reappointment decision, depending on what kind of instructor you are. Um, the teaching evaluations could be used to support teaching awards. Um, and they're sometimes used in aggregate, so across a program, to help better understand the student experiences across the entire program. Um, so the information um, has impact and um, requesting this um, can be helpful for you and also um, potentially for the institution as well. So we encourage you to send out the first information. It's about first invitation. It's about two weeks before the end of the course. Um, and then also um, on the last day of classes, um, send out a final request for students to complete the student evaluation of instructor instruction. Um, you can also check along the way to see what the response rate um, has been for your students, um, for the number of people who have completed it. So you won't know who has completed it, but you can see the percentage of people in the course um, that have completed it. Um, on the last day of classes, you also want to um, do a wrap up of the course. So you've spent the time connecting with the students, you've encouraged them, you started out by the class by sharing some um, information about what inspires you about the course, um, and you've gotten to know a few of your students in the class. Um, so wrap up by sending a short summary of the key concepts and also some recommendations for next steps. So um, if it's kind of a partway through course, what would be some follow up courses that students would be interested in? Um, and, you know, or where else can they go? So um, you want to encourage students to continue learning in this area. Um, so really kind of you're wrapping up the community that you worked really hard to create at the beginning of the class and during the class. And the last thing that you're doing um, at the end of the course is looking at the grade deferrals and submitting your grades. Um, so there, there are checklists. Um, so you also want to check with your department policy or department about any specific grading policies. Um, each department can be different, uh, but in general, the things that you want to do, there's two of them. One is you're looking at um, uh, handling the grade deferral requests. So these would have come in um, with the um, academic concession requests, and these would have been submitted to the faculty um, at least, typically at least three weeks in advance. Um, but it does go through the faculty. So the good news is that it's not up to you to make a decision on whether there's um, a, an accommodation for a deferred grade request. And then you'll also need to upload your final grades from Canvas 
to the faculty service center and this needs to be done two days within two days of the end of the class which is the final exam um so that's as per the university policy um yeah that's a tough time at the end of the year to get all of that grading done um but uh yeah those that's the university policy on that so as we are wrapping up the overview of what the modules have, are there any questions that you have? First of all, this is like a quick round of questions, and then we're going to give you the opportunity to go into breakout groups um, to ask any specific questions. John, I'm wondering if you want to show the course and just briefly highlight some of the things in the course. Sure, Marie. Um, feel free. Uh, um... Marie and Eric to jump in um, once I click here. So I'm actually in, just in the courses in the student view because I actually have teacher access and uh, to the course and, and, and there are things that you probably shouldn't see and may not want to see. <laughs> um, so this is the introduction to teaching online course. And um, perhaps maybe I can, we can link it in the chat. Um, Thank Thanks, you, sir. Eric. Yeah. And so um, the course is broken down into sort of the three modules plus the introduction that we discussed today. So the introduction overview before the start of the term during the course and concluding the course. And also um, a link to a one on one consultation with the learning designer uh, at CTLT. And so the introduction overview. Uh, again, just sort of provide you with sort of the overview of the course itself, um, an overview of the goals and the sort of the, the duration of the course and sort of any um, technical support that you might need. And then also some of the course outcomes and then just an overview of the course structure and a breakdown of what you can expect in each module. And then it dives right into the course, it's uh, to the modules themselves. So uh, before the start of the term, um, a little brief overview of that. And then also some of the um, learning that you might expect or the outcomes that you might expect after uh, taking each module. And each module has uh, uh, certain um, best practices, guidelines um, about uh, what you can expect before the course, during the course, and concluding the course, um, including some checks on your workload and checklists itself, including some of the aspects of Canvas, um, setting up Canvas, configuring Canvas um, that Eric went over and that we sort of briefly touched upon during the course while you're setting it up and while you're um, uh, uh, building your assessments, considering accessibility, considering um, uh, how you enter grades and the rubrics, and also um, uh, sort of your grading policy, um, your the configuration of the course itself in terms of dates and uh, how your content is released and uh, sort of how things are organized and um, and uh, um, configured throughout uh, Canvas. Yeah. So, so just, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you'll see on this page is there's actually several steps that we recommend that you take just to get your course up and ready. Um, so whenever there are the checklists there, those are the kind of the concrete how-to steps um, that link to tool guides um, and other resources to help direct you um, uh, through things that need to be done. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's, uh, well, there's what, 10, 11 steps just in checklist one. Um, and that's just the, the basics for reviewing and revising your, um, your course. Um, and then there's also checklist two. <laughs> so there's quite a few things that are need to be done 
just to get you up and going for the beginning of your term, but it's all laid out for you right here. Um, so hopefully these steps will make it easy and a little bit less overwhelming. Um, as I said, they have been reviewed by um, three or four ISS um, instructional support, the real, the, the wonderful techies that we re rely on <laughs> to get us started. Um, so they'll help you out with it as well. And there's also some guidance on who to contact. Um, maybe we can highlight that um, before we engage in a, maybe a discussion. Sure, um, I just think there's a question from Ian. Oh. Um, so the, CTLT online teaching program um, is a set of resources that were designed um, at the beginning of COVID that were intended to support emergency online or emergency remote teaching. Um, so the target audience um, were people who had to do a really quick um, switch from a traditional face-to-face -face course um, to suddenly teaching um, in sort of emergency mode for supporting the online courses. Um, so we're no longer in emergency remote teaching. And so there's been um, a need to rethink in CTLT the resources that we are providing. Um, so the course, the piece here are specifically for people teaching the fully online courses, right from getting started, um, right through to concluding the courses. It's also very a succinct piece. It'll take um, you know eight to ten hours if you go through everything and do the application of things. Um, we're also planning on um, uh, sunsetting and or relocating some of the resources that are in the online teaching program. And actually a lot of them are being, or some of them at least, have been relocated into this course. So we haven't decided, um, this is from our um, associate director. We're not sure how those communications will um, go out, but things are gonna be, um, yeah, they will be communicated and um, the resources will be available in the form that's um, suitable to other people. John, if you don't mind just going to say um, module three, we can just kind of highlight um, the interactive activity that's there. Um, if you click on modules, instead of going through all of them, just highlight um, a couple of things that make it um, unique. So, well, there's a, there's the faculty spotlight. Um, so once you've gone through all the information from the course, um, uh, Katie Lee Bunting has um, shared some of her course materials and also there should be a video that eventually loads here um, to hear directly from Katie. Um, about how she connects with her students. Um, and also there are um, in the apply to the course section. Um, I'm not sure why the video is not loading. Maybe it's because we're- um, Kaltura. <laughs> it's a, Kaltura. It's a, it's a Eric's note about Kaltura, not- uh, Okay, so if you go to the- the student view. Okay, if you go to the apply to your course section as well, there are example messages. So um, the end of course message um, at the bottom of the screen are messages that Katie um, has sent to her students. So um, some helpful tools that you can, you know, copy um, things um, so you're not needing to recreate everything. Um, so I just wanted to point those out. And then there's one more piece, if you can go back to the modules piece, please. Um, and that's the self-test, the knowledge self-test. Um, so each of the modules has an interactive self-test, um, just a quick and easy review of the key points of the modules. Um, these were all created in H5P, which is newly available to UBC. And um, you're also, of course, available or available, can <laughs> easily incorporate these into your Canvas courses as well wanted to showcase the course um, and the knowledge um, or should we go into the breakout groups now? Maria, I'm thinking we have um, uh, a small group so maybe we can just 
leave it open to a large group discussion. Feel free to just uh, unmute yourself or um, type your questions in chat. Maybe that's uh, since we have a nice cozy group. <laughs> so Jose has a question, a bit of a technical question that might relate to module one, setting up the course. How to share Kaltura Media among courses with different owners. So Eric, I know mm. you've had experience with this. I've <laughs> yeah. been in a few tickets on this too. Yeah, so um, is this a situation where the course is taught by multiple instructors and one instructor has created the media, but they want all instructors to be able to have access to that video? Is that right, Jose? Uh, that is one scenario. The other okay. one is that uh, a faculty member created a course last semester with videos and stuff, and okay. then a sessional teaches in term two, they copy the material, but the ownership of the videos are still with the original creator. Mm -hmm. Okay, a good question. So the, <laughs> the person who yeah. the person who uploaded the video to Kaltura will be classified as the owner of the video. Um, that's kind of how we deal with copyright and ownership of course content. If there is need to transfer ownership to another person, um, you have to contact the LT Hub to initiate that media transfer. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. sure if there was a, an, an official channel to do that, right? So the yeah, LT Hub or, you know, yeah, all the uh, places. That's so. right. LT Hub will be your best bet to contact. Okay. Yeah. Because most of our transfers in geography, they're approved, you know, like the original mm -hmm. creator I guess, gives permission, right? But um, it just sometimes it happens like the week before Carson starts and it takes a while to get it sorted out. So Right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that does come up a lot. And, you know, <laughs> we'll try to get those done as soon as possible, especially before course starts. Okay, and one more question, so I can get out of the way the technical part of it. Yeah. Part of the setting up the course as well. And I think that we have is sometimes we have teachers and TAs, and the teacher might assign somebody to help manage the locker. So I assume mm -hmm. that if you have a TA role in the in the course, you have access to the reserves that the teacher has as well. Can you modify those those locker those uh, reserves? Um, let me double check on that for you. Um, there's different mappings of how some role from Canvas yeah. moves into a locker integration. Let me just check on um, locker really quick. I have it open right now. So a TA, so there's a TA role in locker. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that should allow them to modify or manage items okay. in library online force reserves as well. Um, okay. Yeah. That's good. That should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. No worries, Jose. And if, uh, while we're waiting for some more questions, I'd just like to point out a couple of different resource links to reach out to um, support staff across the university and at CTLT. And one is the LT Hub support page, um, which I'll link to in the chat. And this provides uh, a variety of different points of contact for any of your questions around setting up your course. Uh, some of you might have instructional support units that support your faculties directly. Um, there might be questions around media and learning analytics who have their own support links as well as like copyright. Um, and then LT Hub ha also has their own support link for um, many other different types of questions. Uh, around Canvas and the tools that are built around it. Um, the other support link that I want to also highlight is the um, online teaching program one-on-one -on -one consultations link. And so this is the link that you can use to reach out to our teams at uh, uh, UBCO and UBC Vancouver for learning, learning design support um, for questions around uh, course design, course design strategies, uh, please fill out this form um, and uh, a member of our team will reach out to you uh, for any of your questions. Around this. Marie. Um, also for teaching strategies. So if you're teaching your course and it's just, you know, what should I do here? This has come up. Um, anything on the sort of the teaching related side of things, um, please do reach out to us. I, I have another question, if I may. Of course. Yeah, I've been going through the the CL the CTLT online teaching program, and there's considerable emphasis that's given to 
for instructors to upload their synchronous lectures, to record them and upload them onto the Canvas site so that the students can listen to them at another time. Now, I realized that that was maybe more applicable to the, to the COVID crisis situation, but is it still recommended that online lectures, if they're synchronous, are to be recorded and, and uploaded to the website? You know, it is up to you. So the idea is that maybe you're offering flexibility to your students. Um, so uh, if they're unable to attend, then they can listen to it later. You can also be helping out students who um, maybe require some screen captioning. So if you've got some um, students who have some accessibility um, uh, challenges, um, then giving them this option is um, something that can be helpful to it. Um, so we do, in general, recommend giving people multiple ways of viewing the materials. Um, but some of that, you know, comes at a decision that you would make related to your particular context and your particular class. Uh, I have a question following up on that, uh, Ashley. Um, are there uh, resources, I'm not sure if it, they would be in, in this uh, Canvas course that you've created or, or elsewhere, but uh, where can we learn how to properly set up um, a Zoom lecture uh, through Canvas and make sure that, that it's recording and, and it available to students? Um, yeah, there are links for that in this course. Um, I think that Eric might be searching for a direct link right now. So Eric, can you jump in? <laughs> You're on Sorry, mute. just finding my unmute button. Um, I was actually looking for our Zoom instructor guide, which does have um, some detailed instructions on how you can run a real-time lecture with Zoom, as well as put that into Canvas. And I'll throw that into the chat right now. Great. Thanks very much. No worries, Jay. Also, just wanted to add that the um, tool guides uh, on the LT Hub website are really great. It's a really great resource just for finding resources and guides on any sort of integrations within Canvas and Canvas itself. Um, they do have a number of tools that were not discussed today, but uh, you might be interested in diving into um, as you think about developing or uh, uh, redesigning at some point your online course. Um, there are a number of tools highlighted uh, on the LT Hub uh, page. Uh, I also wanted to like extend Marie's comments on sort of providing videos uh, uh, pre-recorded videos of lectures on Canvas, and, and I've just been doing some cursory reviews of some literature around that. And, you know, the literature has said that it has helped uh, even students who, are, who do not even require any accessibility accommodations to um, review those materials um, at their own pace. Uh, and it does help them um, prepare for um, other teaching and learning activities and assessments. So there is evidence out there that suggests that providing these materials um, in perpetuity for the rest of your course does help and uh, support students. Does it not mean that students are, are less motivated to actually attend the lectures if they know that they're available at a later time? It really depends on sort of the the design strategy you're using in your online course. So if you're having perhaps your synchronous online teaching um, focused less on the didactic lectures and um, having those lectures pre-recorded and having your synchronous lectures focus more on perhaps active learning experiences, connective, connected learning experiences between peers, um, then maybe sort of that's perhaps sort of a, a design approach that could be more ideal for using pre-recorded lectures um, for those kinds of materials rather than for those for that type of learning rather than um, uh, purely just lecturing online synchronously. Um, so I think from a design standpoint, um, there could be some choices that could be made around um, how uh, a synchronous lecture could be made more um, 
of an experience for the learner in terms of an active learning experience, experiential learning experience between peers, uh, rather than simply just a didactic lecture. So it's, I think it's just really a, a choice in the design. Yeah, I agree what John is saying. Um, so it would mean that when students are coming together, they're maybe, um, you know, working on a, a problem as part of the lecture. Um, so they can get that feedback as they work through the problem. Um, so it could be, um, what do you, which discipline do you teach in, Ian? Uh, in geography. Okay. Um, I don't know much about geography, but um, <laughs> um, there's, you know, some applied pieces. So there may be a problem solving piece. So as part of uh, a lecture, um, it could be um, you give a problem and you start out with doing the answer on your own, then you turn to a pair um, and then you go into a group of people. And um, as they go through this process, um, you as an instructor, you could be checking into um, uh, and maybe not revealing what the right answer is in this um, example I'm thinking of, um, but see how the decisions evolve as you maybe go from a single to a pair to a group. Um, so, you know, you'd be teaching them those applied skills um, and, um, you know, working in groups. Um, so, yeah, so it's what John is saying, I'm just giving one example of what a lecture could be used for, even in a class of, um, you know, 200 students, um, this kind of thing could happen. Um, if you would like to discuss this further, um, the uh, educational consultants are very happy to give you some ideas and, and focus specifically on uh, what you're looking at. I also know, I believe jo Jose is also from geography. So um, part one of our people here. So just wanna let you know, you've got a variety of people that you can call out on. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm in geography in case you have any questions. But I'm more on the technical side, right? So, but uh, okay. I agree with what the design uh, mentioned about the, um, I know a few faculty members here have used the, the record the lectures and the set them out. It's kind of like a, like a hybrid teaching, right? Um, they, they, they put the lecture, the, the didactic part of it online and, the, uh, and then they use the, the synchronous time for Q and A's and problem solving, right? So as a way of cementing the knowledge to see how it's being acquired, so. Okay, that makes sense, thanks a lot. That's a great question though, because I think that's something uh, we as learning designers get frequently is do these pre-recorded lectures, what does that do in terms of motivation and how do we promote real active learning in a, in a synchronous class, in synchronous class time? And so a lot of instructors do use that, these pre-recorded lectures as pre-reading for um, the synchronous class time and um, um, really try to strat strategize around those materials and preparation for that synchronous class time. So perhaps the synchronous class time is highlighting key messages from those pre-recorded videos and um, using that synchronous class time for case studies, um, from based learning, um, uh, uh, group work, uh, uh, formative feedback from the instructors, TAs themselves. So there's a, a um, uh, uh, you could really leverage the asynchronous and synchronous to your advantage in this case with pre-recorded lectures. Ian, you asked a question that gets people in our area excited. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's something that's been on my mind a lot in the transition from traditional classroom teaching into an online format. And I thought that th this idea of putting a pre-recorded recorded lectures gives them an advantage because in a classroom, students don't have the option. I mean, they, they have to be in the room and go to the lectures. And if they miss it, then you know normally they have to ask their friends or colleagues to get the notes and so on. So I wondered why is it available to an online student, but not to an in-person an in classroom student. But what you said makes complete sense and, and I have a better understanding now. Okay, happy to follow up with you at any time. Um, John as well. <laughs> Super. That's a, wonderful. Any other questions before um, we wrap up today? And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Yeah. And um, hopefully everyone has access to 
uh, the introduction to teaching online Canvas course. Um, it's please, just been launched. <laughs> please do share it um, with your coworkers. It's a brand new um, initiative. Um, so we are in the process of doing some more communications about it, but please do um, help us out by sharing the resource. And uh, of course, we'll always, you know, any kind of feedback that you might have for us, um, there will be um, revisions made to it every once in a while. I've also posted a link to a feedback form in the chat. Feel free to um, click on the link and provide some feedback about the Summer Institute. And thank you all for joining as well. Thank you, everyone. We'll hang around in case there's any questions.